Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Friday Fast Track HSM Hangout. Today we've got several special guests with us. We've got Brandon Feldman, who is a tattoo artist and master machinist at Feldman Manufacturing. We've got Garen Gardner from the Autodesk Business Development team. And uh, Matt Nichols may or may not be able to join us. He had a power outage in his area in St. Louis last night. So uh, we may have Wayne Griffenberg stepping in walking through uh, Matt's portion a little bit later today, but uh, welcome everyone, thanks for joining us. What, what we're gonna be going through today is, you know, we keep talking about these fast track events that are happening across the US, and uh, Brandon actually hosted one at his shop uh, about two weeks ago. So Brandon's gonna, you know, share some of his work and what went on at that fast track event and uh, the meetup that followed. And uh, after that, Garen Gardner will be getting into uh, Fusion 360 and showing us some of the models and things that they were creating at this event and then either Matt or Wayne at the end of Garen's um, you know modeling portion will jump in and show us some tool paths and posting code so uh, that's what we'll be going through today uh, one quick announcement I want to make before we get started is uh, you know we, we keep talking about Autodesk University week after week in these uh, in these fast track hangouts uh, all of the classes have all been submitted. They were due, I believe, on the 16th of this month. So uh, what we're doing now is actually voting. We're, we're asking our community to vote on the classes that you'd like to see at Autodesk University. So if you uh, search Autodesk University in, uh, you know, in Google or in any search engine, you'll be pulled up to the Autodesk University page, and I think the first thing that will pop up is the courses that you would like to see. So you know, there's there's a range of courses from our customers that you know want to get in and do advanced tool paths, you know this one, this example here is on advanced post processor customization from uh, Renee and our, our development team. So, you know we want your input. We want to see what the community is interested in at Autodesk University. What type of content would you like to learn more about? Um, you know as we as we continue engaging with the community. So, um, you know please everyone, we we encourage you to vote here. These these courses will be made available online after Autodesk University. Of course, we encourage everyone to attend. Uh, locally, and uh, the the recent Fusion Cam Challenge winner um, just received a trip to Autodesk University. So we encourage you to follow Instagram. Uh, Al, do you recall who was it? Uh, winner yeah, of that last. Bill up in Canada. Uh, they do aftermarket machine components for Harley Davidson motorcycles and a five-axis Herco. Phil Butterworth, I believe, is his name. Yeah, so you can you can learn more about that on the Fusion 360 blog. So check that out. You know what he won and what some of the other winners um, were awarded for their contributions to that. But you know, please, we we encourage everyone in our community. You know, come to Autodesk University, participate in what you'd like to see presented. We want to have CAM and HSM a big part of Autodesk University this year, bigger than last year. So um, to kick things off, you know, we'll just you know with with Autodesk University in mind. You know, how many of you have been to Autodesk University? This is really important to you know the future of of our CAM group. And you know we want the community to be more and more engaged and be a bigger part of Autodesk University. So let's get some more votes in here. Maybe you're already on the website voting for which classes you'd like to see, but let's let's get this vote in first. Okay, so I'm going to close this. So about 21% of the audience attended Autodesk University last year. So that's that's pretty good representation. You know we'd like to see that much higher, of course. Um, but you know that, that's pretty impressive and. Of course, if you're making chips fly, you'll you'll watch them online after. That's that's why we want your feedback. What types of content would you like to see at Autodesk University that you'd like to see in the future? So, going to hide this. Um, continuing on here. So, you know a little bit about what Brandon will be talking about. You know, the team will be talking about today are these fast track events. So, the Autodesk Fast Track program is several things. Today, we're going to be focusing on the seminars that have been going on across the U.S. Brandon is based in Nashville. Uh, we have another fast track event coming up in Tampa next week. So if you're anywhere in Central Florida, we encourage you to uh, attend that. It will be at the local Haas HFO in Tampa. But uh, when you sign up for this fast track program, you know, you're, you're getting access to these events. You're getting, you know, these weekly webinars. You're also getting plural site training for free. And uh, the 30-day trial here, as I, as I mentioned last week, is a little misleading. The 30-day trial is for HSM or Fusion if you're not already using it, but you still have access to all this other content. So I'm um, going to ask quickly who, who is part of the Fast Track program. Whether you've attended an event, you know, obviously everyone is here on these Friday Fast Track Hangouts. 
but uh, have you attended any other local events in your territory or in your area? Um, or maybe you're in an area that we haven't yet hosted an event. You know, we'd love to hear where you are and uh, if, if you'd like to see an event there and, you know, if you've got suggestions for places where we might be able to host an event that you'd be interested in. Or also types of content that you'd love to see at these fast track events or meetups. You mentioned I'm already a level 70 master machinist. Uh, makes me think a couple of the level 70s we we mention on this call every week. Uh, Rob Lockwood, Lauren, Seth. Uh, all of these guys submitted classes for AU, so uh, it, again, it's a good chance to come learn from other power users. It's not just developers that are submitting stuff. Yeah, and a lot of the audience here may have seen, you know, these level 70 machinists that Al just mentioned on previous recordings. If you haven't seen them yet, you know, all those recordings are available on our YouTube channel, so you can check out the type of presentation skills that they have, and, you know, if you'd like to see more from them, you know, we encourage you to to vote on their courses to, uh, to make that happen. So a lot of the audience has already been part of the Fast Track program, so that's fantastic. If, if there's additional content that you'd like to see as part of the Fast Track program or things that you're missing or haven't yet found, you know, let us know in the comments what, what else you'd like to see, what else you'd like um, you know, Autodesk to provide you to become more successful with you know, CAM and HSM. So, you know, moving along, you know, we were talking a lot about Autodesk University. That's really what the Fast Track program is, is this journey to Autodesk University. So you see John Saunders here on the right. You know, we, we want to encourage our community to be very, very involved in this. And I keep reiterating that, but it's very important to, uh, to see our community present as, you know, internally at Autodesk, we're making a big commitment to CAM and to HSM. So we want to show that this is making an impact on our community, and we want you to be there to really show up, you know, how strong this community is. So, um, you know, the last question I'm going to ask before I hand it over to Brandon, uh, what, what is most likely to drive growth in your business? And, you know, this, this helps us understand where the development team needs to focus, what kind of content we need to provide on these fast track hangouts, and, uh, you know, just direct feedback to the product manager, to the development team on what's important to our community and what you would like to see. So pretty pretty even spread here. Um, you know, a third of the audience is actually interested in true four or five axis. So I know that's something that we haven't shown too too much of uh, in the recent time. So that's uh, that's that's good to see that. And uh, about a third is also in the two to three axis milling. So we do have a lot of content on two to three axis milling on our YouTube channel. If there's specific things you'd like to see with two to three axis milling on these fast track hangouts, you know, we'd love to hear your feedback in the comments. To be honest, that's going to be the focus of this one, right? The the project that Garen and and Wayne are working through is a good example of both two and three axis milling. So for twenty eight percent of you, that's that's good. Uh, we clearly need to get some webinars going on some of the four and five axis. We did that walk or get one recently, but uh, yeah, not just from a development perspective. We we should probably do some more education around those areas. Awesome, thanks, Al. So. Um... Yeah, so, you know, that, that's fantastic to see a nice distribution here. But uh, with that said, you know, I'm going to hand it over to Brandon. Brandon, maybe if you can introduce yourself and, you know, share about the killer event that you hosted in Nashville uh, two weeks ago and, uh, you know, what your experience was. Yeah, I'm, I'm here in Nashville. Uh, I'll give you a little back, uh, a little back story on me. Um, so th that's a picture of uh, some of the tattoo machines that I build. Um, quick backstory. Um, I've been tattooing for 16 years and uh, I started building machines out of curiosity uh, 14, 15 years ago, almost right when I started tattooing. And I cast them and messed around with them and filed them and had no idea um, kind of how to get cast the casting straight or drill holes into them. Uh, I bought a bridge port, uh, didn't know how to use it went through all of that, kept buying manual machines, bridge ports, then started getting some um, some business and people wanted to buy the machines. I started hiring machine shops to make me kind of simple pieces and went through the whole, kind of the whole cycle through that and fast forward to like a year and a half ago, um, I knew what SolidWorks was by, by the, some of the machinists that had designed parts for me and and it was kind of magic. So uh, I, I didn't think I could get SolidWorks. I had no idea 
really about anything. I'm not uh, computer savvy, really. I'm getting there, but I downloaded Fusion, and um, a guy that was an avid SolidWorks user showed me how to draw some straight lines, and I started um, watching YouTube videos, and that helped me. Um, and I just started drawing things really, really oddly, uh, probably to somebody that's been using CAD CAM for a long time. And I still kind of do it uh, maybe un unorthodoxly. But anyway, the kind of the backstory speeds up to me understanding how to get my parts drawn in Fusion and then start to apply that in the, in the CAM uh, aspect and figure out how do I get these parts made and worked with uh, my buddy Kale who works for Haas and I stumbled into the HFO. One thing led to another and I bought a VF2. I didn't know how to use it and thanks to Fusion really and, and Kale and, and Haas, I make my parts uh, very well which blows my mind most of the time because I'm not a classically trained uh, CNC machinist or even machinist, I just have kind of fallen in love with it over the past 15 years and since Fusion and and getting the Haas, I've really fallen in love with it and I've really kind of fallen in love with the whole community of uh, CAD CAM and I've, I met uh, Chris Chen and uh, I went to Autodesk University and I went to IMCS and I got to, I've gotten to meet so many really great people, and um, I mean, my whole life before that was just tattooing, so it's kind of a, a little bit of a new change. But I we had the uh, the HSM fast track here, and we had the the Fusion meetup, and it was really cool. And I got to meet people that were using Fusion and, and making parts. And I've since gone to some of these guys' shop and seen. Uh, uh, seen some of their CNC machines here in Nashville and um, it's kind of I think that it's going to grow and it's kind of exciting and uh, I think that the HSM fast tracks are really amazing and I, I I know that it's already catching on but I really hope that it catches on big time because it's like free training and you can walk into a, a maker space or wherever they're hosted HFO and get this training which is incredible to me just for the sheer fact that when I was learning Fusion, it was really difficult for me to find a good source for learning. And even with Pluralsight, which I've learned about, and cross my fingers if I can figure out how to turn the camera on, I'm going to do I'm going to uh, do a Pluralsight uh, author a Pluralsight uh, vi uh, how-to video. And um, I, I I mean it's just at your fingertips. Like everyone. Uh, can just go out and do this. It's, it's pretty wild. Um, it almost makes it too easy. Um, I, I would imagine that old older CNC machinists that had to figure out how to connect the dots and use Mastercam version one and all kinds of wild things. I've heard uh, it. I mean, it's so much easier. So it's, we should all be very lucky that we can be a part of that. But we we got to do some cool things at the. Uh, at the at the meetup and also the HSM um, event, we got to run some really cool uh, bottle cap openers. Um, Matt came a few days prior, and we uh, we CNC machined um, some some type for a letterpress printer that was the letterpress was made in in 1920, and we CNC machined. Uh, yeah, let me. It'll take me one second. I'll I'll talk about it and and put a picture of that right now um, so what we did is we we drew the we got the fusion F and we extruded it um, backwards because to be able to print the on the letterpress you've got to be able to it, it prints backwards and then it once it shows up on the paper I'm air dropping this right now um, it uh it prints forwards. Anyway, we uh, we CNC machine that, and hang on. I'm sorry. Almost got it. If I can't get it up, you can go on to um, on the Instagram and see this. Uh, yeah, it's not cooperating with me. 
anyway, it, it's just a big Fusion F. It was machined, um, and we were able to print these posters. Somebody's got, oh, here we go. There we go. Okay. So you can, can you see that F? Oh, we see it. Yep. Okay, cool. So you can see the, uh, the machined aluminum there. Um, Matt and I just quickly wrote a little program for that, machined it, and as the, the rollers apply the ink to the, to the pipe there, it then presses the paper in between that. And I don't have a picture of the, 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 the actual poster that was printed, although we can probably load those onto a website after this. Um, it was a whole natural inspired uh, poster that was for the, the meetup event. So that's really cool that we were able to take some, in my opinion, cutting edge technology and, and mix it with a, a old machine and, and get that. And it's, it really printed crisply and clean and it, it was exciting and that was super stoked and so was I. And then we also, uh, we also made the, the bottle cap opener, which I think is uh, one of your Tim's design. And um, I didn't want to order. Uh, I didn't want to order a special tool, so we dropped. Uh, we on the second off, we dropped uh, a little quarter inch end mill in, and we did the undercut that was supposed to be done with a like a little um, woodruff cutter or something like that. And um, that was cool. And all the people that came to the event enjoyed watching the machine uh, make the parts, and everyone got to meet everyone. And I. I, I think it was great, and we're going to do another one and continue and hopefully grow this. Uh, I'll, before I get off, I, I want to say uh, I recently went to the TCAT school, which is the Tennessee um, technical school here. The Tennessee offers free machinist training all throughout Tennessee. Anyway, anyway, I went into the school to get some interns, and it was really interesting to me to see what what the future is supposed to be for, for our manufacturing and what people are not able to see. And it, it really kind of was the eye opener for me. So I, I gave a little talk to some of these guys that are learning machining and, um, and a little bit of the feedback that I got was, um, oh, Fusion, it, once Fusion mature, matures, we'll think about teaching um, teaching some of these students fusion. I was like, what do you mean when it matures? Like I, I make parts all day long on it. Um, I had a guy come when I first bought the CNC machine that, that programmed this piece uh, in MasterCam for me and it because I couldn't I couldn't do it in fusion quite yet. And I've recently, like five, six months ago, I've reprogrammed that in fusion and the cycle time in MasterCam with this guy who's been CNC machining for 15 years was, it was 14 minutes for one piece. And I've now gotten that same exact piece, better surface finish and everything. I make that piece in three minutes and 53 seconds. So I don't know, I, I keep hearing like some of this and I, I kind of get a little bit bent out of shape because I, I think that it's, I mean, it makes complex parts. Like you see it on Instagram all day long. So I just want to, vent a little bit about that but and i t and i try Thank to tell people on our behalf and it's it's uh it's fun to hear you say that and it's even funnier to hear you say that you're not a machinist and you're you're bringing cycle times from 15 minutes to three minutes i think you're you become an honorary machinist even if you're not classically trained well it's happening and it's thanks to fusion and you know i talk to, to jeff from backhand bikes all the time and i talk to some of these machinists and that kind of is the thing like i am not I didn't grow up in, in, in working in a CNC machine shop. I didn't run cycles for the first five years and apprentice out and learn all this stuff with MasterCam and all that. But like I said before, it's, it's being made easy. I mean, everybody's got the, the ability to, to do this. I'm running what I would call really fast machining, aggressive high-speed machining that upsets most old machinists when they come in here. Some people... Some some machinists have come in here and gotten mad at me because I'm not running coolant on a part on a on an end mill when I'm cutting into steel that would it would explode if I ran coolant that's so hot. I, you got to run air blast. You got to move fast with this stuff, and it's just it's I, I just think it's funny because I mean all these guys, no disrespect to to where they came from, but let's 
let's get on the train that's moving fast now. You know, like I think it's, you hit, you hit I think it's important. I hadn't really realized e earlier, actually, is a classically trained machinist, and, and I'm one, who comes from an apprenticeship, and the value of an apprenticeship is on the job learning around other experts. And before the internet, before the connected world we, we live in, uh, that required you to be on site, but you just mentioned you talk to Jeff all the time. So it's almost like the apprenticeship of the future is this ability to leverage social media and other techniques so that you're you're apprenticing from all kinds of experts all over the world, and that's possible because of uh, the world we live in today. And it's different. Radical the, collaboration, right? Yeah, exactly. It's it, You don't have to be all under the same roof anymore to learn from each other. And that was the case you, in machining not too long ago. I want to I want to say this real quick before I pass it off to the next person. I, I, I told this story in the TCAT school to all these machinists. So I've tattooed for, for 16, almost 17 years. I've traveled the world tattooing. I've met people even before the internet. We, you know, we, we talked on the phone, whatever, however we met each other. But tattooing has been like a real close knit um, business for me. I've met people from from Sweden, Germany, I've been all over the place. Japanese uh, people, I've been to Japan, tattooed there. Um, I'm going to go to Israel in, in uh, a couple months, and uh, I told these machinists, these these guys have even they've even been in school for like three or four weeks. They're just so fresh, right? I told them, hey, in my profession, the one coolest thing about tattooing was I got to travel and meet all these people, and we all spoke the same language. It didn't matter. And now with social media and machinists and things getting collaborated, collaborated upon, that's possible. And as a machinist, you get to do the same thing tattooers did and still do. I think that's cool. Like, I could probably find somebody on the Internet and say, hey, let's do a cool project together with your machine in Spain or Germany. or It doesn't matter, really. It could be in the next state over even with Jeff or I go to Kamal Kamal shop when I'm out in Modesto I got to go to um, Pier 9 I got to meet all those people there it's I used to go and travel and go into tattoo shops but now I go and travel and I go into other people's machine shops I was in Vancouver I got to go and see um, Amish's uh, shop at the uh, CAD cam and it's kind of weird like I used to just go in the tattoo shops and now I'm now I'm going in the machine shop. So that, that's 100% true. I can attest to that 100%. You're going to start seeing machinists be travelers at this point because of the Internet and, and, and also because of this disruptive manufacturing um, that Fusion is doing. So I think we should, should we transition to the bottle opener now and, and have Garen kind of work through that? I know we got some feedback in the last webinar. Yeah. They'd love yeah. to keep Yeah from our users we loved hearing from you Brandon but it's it's great to get some products I think maybe it's a good time to transition absolutely Brandon one last question before handing it over when, when did you initially connect with Kale at Haas how long um, ago was that uh, a year and three months ago that's awesome I, had, I mean I literally the, in a year and three I, months I, you're connected <laughs> okay. yeah, I bought the machine uh, uh, May 26th last year it got here May 26th last year so Coming up on a year. So you're you're on a one year anniversary of your Haas machine, and you've been connected with you know a significant amount of the community in many different locations. So that's that's awesome that you shared that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Thanks, guys. I'm going to stay on the line, but I'm going to mute. Thank you for letting me talk. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks for joining us, for Brandon. Brandon. Oh, I think this might be the first time we did a demo on a Mac too. <laughs> That's funny. I can go grab my Windows uh, PC somewhere. No, no, it's all good. Okay. Uh, so, so you know, kind of what we did at uh, Brandon's place, you know, we wanted to show a little bit about uh, modeling in Fusion 360 and then have something that we could go over to the machine and, and actually cut out. So um, I'll go through the example, just building the bottle opener from scratch, and then either Matt or Wayne will go through putting tool paths on it, and then from there, uh, you know, in, in a, a real fast track, would actually walk right over to one of the Haas machines and uh, and you'd see it in action. So it's kind of fun to, to see all of that. But we'll start out with, I'm just going to create 
a, a top-down sketch for our bottle opener. And Fusion has, you know, a lot of a lot of standard sketching type of tools. One that I use quite often when doing things like this is a slot. It's kind of an automation of two circles connected together uh, with tangent lines. So instead of having to do all the construction, I can easily come in and just say I have a slot and we can put in the, the diameter of the, the slot and then we can also come in and put the, the width of this. So in the bottle opener, this is gonna be where the cap goes in and, uh, and we, can, we can open it up. So we'll start out with just that sketch and start pushing it up and you'll notice, if you haven't used Fusion before, you'll notice I use one command a lot and that's this press pull command. Uh, if I pick a profile, I can extrude with it. If I pick an edge, I can put a fillet on it. So it's kind of my go-to command for a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of what I do in the in the software. Um, we're just going to come up 0 .7, uh, 0 0.475, and there's my the first part of my profile. Um, we want to offset the top and give us a little clearance for that pot bottle cap. So we'll come in something like 0 0.135, um, and we can go a negative direction just by putting a negative value in there to get it on the inside. The nice thing, these are all associative, so if I were to change that value, it uh, updates the sketch as well. So that's the, the nice thing with Fusion 360. You also have a timeline across the bottom that will capture everything I do as I add the different features and sketches in here. Um, we're just gonna drag that down a little bit. And also, you, you get a nice nice preview. You can see in here that I'm, I'm removing material. If I were to drag it up, you can see it up. So it's very dynamic. A lot of times when I'm sketching, I'll just do something really quick and then come back later and start locking down dimensions. So, you know, the, the preview is really great to be able to see if I'm adding or removing material. Um, if I want to do any kind of, of analysis, I can, or uh, if I want to do a cross section and see what my model looks like through that, you know, we need to put a little lip here that we can, that uh, we can get around the bottle cap to pop off. So with that, we have a, a sketch here just for sake of time got a little sketch we'll use and I can use a revolve command in there and then with with the revolve command let me just minimize this a little bit uh, I can also come in and select the the center of rotation and I don't quite want it to go 360 degrees we're looking for more something like 70 degrees and we want that to go symmetrical so we can see it's going both directions let's turn off that cross section you can see it going both directions and what it's doing here, it's actually going 70 degrees one direction and 70 degrees the other direction because I did symmetrical. So one of the nice things that I use quite a lot is just e equations in uh, when, I'm, when I'm modeling. So I can actually come in here and do divided by two. And you can do all sorts of algebra algebraic equations in here. So if you want to add, you know, do, do all sorts of equations and use parameters for that, you can do it. And anytime you come back, let's just edit that. When you come back, there's still equations. It's not just converting it to 35 degrees each way. Um, so this is a really great way if you have certain things that you want to lock in and let the, let the system do the math for you, you can do that. Uh, but once we have that, we'll add a couple of fillets, smooth this out a little bit. So as I mentioned, I'll use the press pull command, same command I used to, uh, to extrude that original profile. We can just tug that out a little bit. You can see the, the dynamic nature of, of the fillet. And then we can come in and, you know, usually I'll kind of eyeball it, get it close to what I want, and then put in a, uh, a uh -oh. regular dimension. I'm going to call this out because you made a mistake. Uh-oh. Uh, no, it's a good one. Um, he put a, a 0.125, a 1 radius, and this is just a little trick for you designers out there. Um, it's always a good idea to make your radius 10% bigger than the cutter diameter so you don't the cutter doesn't have to stop in the middle. So, uh, you know, there we go. Um, so now we're making a little bit, the radius a little bit bigger. And, and now the cut, uh, one eighth cutter can roll through that, or sorry, a quarter inch cutter can roll through it instead of stopping in the corner. So little design for manufacturing trip. trip along Thanks, there. Al. Yeah, and, and I don't know if you caught that, but any of these features I can easy, easy enough, just come back, double click, or uh, you can right click and hit edit. You know, there's various things in here that you can do, rename, edit, delete, but um, that's a great way to come back to any of the features. Um, in fact, with the, the tree, I can roll this all the way back and I can see step-by-step step what I've done in the model. So I can click through and see each thing along the way. And this is a great way for learning too. If, you, if, you, if somebody gives you a model, 
one of the first things I do is just play through it and see how they created it. Um, I've, I've learned how to use software a lot with uh, being able to just watch, go through the history and see how they made their assemblies, you know, how, may, how I might go, go about doing it a little bit differently. Uh, it's a great way to just interrogate a design or even remember how you made it if it's something you did a while ago. Uh, okay, and then let's come in and just grab these, uh, these front edges just to smooth those off a little bit. We'll drag those in and we won't worry too much about the size that we put in there just for, uh, for the demonstration, but uh, we've got something like that. And then we want to add, we want a little bit of clearance to slide, the, slide this over the pop bottle lid. So with that, I've got a sketch that we're going to use that, um, let's see if I can find it, there we go. And we're just going to press, we're just going to push that down a little bit so that we have a little clearance. There we go. And you'll notice as I do that, again, nice little preview showing me that it's removing material from here. And pretty quickly, we're able to model up that, that opener. So we can see here, we need a handle on it still, but we can see what that's going to look like uh, to get the handle started. And there's some fun things that we're going to do with this as well. Uh, with the handle, we're just going to grab this cylinder, pull it up. A, a little tip, if you're dragging this up, I can actually pick a parallel top face, and it'll snap it to the same height. So if I don't know what height it is, and I don't want to go pull a measurement, I can just start dragging that up, pick that height, so now those are coplanar. Nice little way to do that. Um, but with that handle back on, you know, we have this environment called sculpt, and a lot of people, or form, uh, a lot of people think this is primarily for consumer products uh, doing these crazy freeform shapes. This actually has a lot of practical capabilities in, in designing a lot of things that you guys may do today. Um, I'm going to start out with just using an extrude. And I think this will help you kind of understand a little bit more what you can do with, with the sculpt environment. But I'm going to drag these up a little bit. And they just look like surfaces. They're just thin, thin, thin surfaces, not much to them. Um, but what I can do with this is come in and say, let's bridge those two edges together. And I just double click one edge to grab the whole chain, that whole top edge. Same on the other side. You can see I have two arrows pointing the same direction. So I know that it's going to create a surface like I would expect. And it's just bridge those together. You know, if I were to do this with other products, I'd usually have to create multiple sketches. I'd have to generate a loft. And then it would be a little bit of a pain to actually go in and modify this. Um, and I do have quite a few control edges in here. And some of them I don't really need. So I'm going to delete every other one of them. And I can just grab it, delete them out. Um, so I don't have to worry about controlling so many edges there. Uh, but the nice thing about this is then I can grab some of these edges and just kind of start pushing and pulling and tugging this around. And again, imagine, you know, if you want to add just some, some nice, nice form factor, nice uh, ergonomics to some of your designs, you can do that. Um, but, you know, we can see here that it's rounded off and maybe we want that to be just vertical edges instead of rounding that off. So I can come and grab each of those and say, let's just crease those and give me nice sharp edges. So you can control if it's going to be a nice hard crease or if it's going to be a nice smooth surface. And then, you know, we may want to grab these and scale those in a little bit more. So just to, to give me little indentation there. So really within just a couple of minutes, I have a nice little handle there. And that's, again, something that if I were to do that with lofting, I'd, I'd have to generate multiple planes, multiple sketches, loft those together. It would be a little bit, a uh, little bit of a pain to do that. Um, and then notice there's still surfaces, so we've got a, a nice little command in here that allows me to grab each of these, the surfaces and those two solid bodies, and say let's just make a new part out of all of that. So we'll just say make a, a new component, and we can also tell it what parts we want to keep and, and turn into a, a full solid unit. And there we go. We have a, a nice solid component. If I do a, a cross-section analysis, let's turn off all the other things in there. So we have one solid body with that nice surface. And the great thing about it is at any time I can come back and make changes. So if we came back in here and wanted to tweak that a little bit, you know, I could grab this edge and maybe pull it down a little bit. It's very flexible to be able to, to do that. So you're, you, it's not a one stop, you use it once and that's all you can do. You can see here that it just updated that, uh, that, that solid now. 
Um, but in here, we may want to add a couple of fillets around. So we may want to put just a small round on here. We'll do something like 0.125. And um, much the same, we'll, we'll do another one up around the, the top edge and this side. And we'll do something like 0.25, a little bit larger. So pretty quickly, we've gone through that. A uh, couple, couple things left, and I'll hand it over to, to Matt. Or has Matt joined us by chance? Power Doesn't look is still like Matt here yet. Yeah. All right. All right. So one thing that uh, while while I'm wrapping up, uh, I'm going to come in and say let's let's do a live sharing session. You know, we talk a bit about uh, rich collaboration with Fusion 360, and that's the data is in the cloud. This allows us to share a design with other folks. But what if I want to? What if I'm working in a design review environment? I want to share this with other folks. Um, what I'm going to do, let's uh, not do that, fire this up again. Uh, what, what design review allows us to do, we'll see if we can do it real quick. Uh, I, I can have a design open, I can start a live review session. You, you can get a link where you can pick on, so all of you guys could get that link and I'll post it in our, uh, I'll post it in, in our go to meeting. And you guys could see exactly what I was doing just through a browser. So if I put a fillet on something, change the size of it, you guys could see it. You could spin it around. So it's not just seeing a static image. It's actually being able to interrogate the design, have conversations about, you know, maybe we need a bigger fillet here or, you know, maybe we need to, to make that pocket a little bit larger based on the, the tools we have. And uh, it's a really great way to be able to collaborate. So we'll see if we can get that come, to come up real quick. And that, that live review, I believe, still is a preview function. So if you're not seeing it in your instance of Fusion, it's a preview that you need to turn on. And while, while this is coming up, we also have uh, the, the data is in the cloud. So we're working on Matt and Wayne and I are all working on the same project. So the design that I just kicked off, uh, I saved a version of it. Wayne, uh, Wayne will be able to see that and uh, start, start adding tool paths on it right away. So it's a very dynamic way that we can work off of this. Uh, you know, we can capture the versions and, and all of that. So maybe while I'm pulling this up, uh, I was pretty much done with it. Wayne, do you wanna, do you wanna start adding the tool paths on it and we can come back and do live review yeah, in a few minutes? At the end of the webinar, so why don't we, why don't we switch over to Wayne? Sounds yeah. good. So you should see on my screen, I have, uh, I'm working inside of A360 here, uh, our Fusion team view. And uh, a part that, uh, that Garen was working on, this is a representation, like as I was following through, I could see some of the updates that he was working on. I think this is a representation of that part he was working on, I was going to finish it up here. Um, but I'm going to walk through uh, what Matt did uh, when he worked with Garen and Brandon when they were at the show there, uh, setting up the toolpath to be able to send them over to the VF2. So I'm able to see it in this in my browser as well. I can go and take a look at it. I can put some uh, measurements and I can find out what the distance is from here to here. So I can see live as we're working on uh, the part and get information back. And I can also send comments back or add some comments and markups so that Garen and Matt can see what's going on. You know, and you know, anybody can, I'm not trying to make this a sales pitch, but anybody can add markups. Maybe, uh, maybe just for fun, create a share link and paste that in the chat and and then some other people can see just the so up in the right hand corner. Yeah, you can see how you could how you could share that out with people that don't have Fusion. So we can say copy. Uh, we'll paste that in the chat. And for anybody that wants to take a look, um, uh, Curtis actually said he's got a swag pack. So why don't you why don't you throw it in the chat? And we'll randomly pick one of the users uh, within the next hour. So maybe after the webinar wraps up, that makes a comment. We'll we'll throw you in a drawing and get you a swag pack. Oh, there we go. So I just added a link uh, to the chat window in our in our GoToWebinar so you guys can link and see this part and work with it and add some comments. So I'm going to open it up. So I'm going to go right up into Edit right up here. Uh, I'm going to edit the design, not in my browser, but I'm going to edit on the desktop. And it'll give me a chance now. It'll pop up. Now, if I didn't have Fusion installed, it's a small download. In the background, it will do that. Um, I don't have to because it just opened up that part right inside of my Fusion that I can work on here. So I'm going to try to do some justice as to what Matt worked on when he was there with Garen and Brandon. Uh, so I'm going to walk through some of those toolpaths the way he set it up 
uh, to run on the VF2. So I'm going to switch from the model view, and as you can see, the, the browser history or the history the timeline on the bottom, the browser of the construction, and a lot of those same sketches that Garam was working on. I'm going to go into the cam view, and uh, actually, it looks like they already had some tool paths up, so I'm going to delete that out. So this isn't the exact one that uh, Garam was working on, but this is what he was building up to. So this is what we would do, is as I'm watching live, he would hand it over to me, and I'd be able to add some tool paths and send it back to him. So the first thing I want to do is I want to try to rough this out as much as I can, representing what was in uh, the stock that's in the part or in the machine. So I'm going to first do my setup, working from left to right, go into setup, and I'm going to leave that at the center there. I'm going to leave my my uh, G54 right there. Uh, what I do want to use is use the stock that was made in the model. So it, the team made a model in here, so I'm going to use that as stock. Uh, I can also just set up the stock here, but I just want to show you that you can do this. So if I expand down in some of the bodies that were created, and I know Garam was working to get to here, uh, to be able to add some bodies that represent the stock uh, in here, um, actually, I don't think I see it here. That's okay. We're just going to set it up as a body here or, or the stock size. So I can do a relative size stock and make sure that we have at least a, a quarter inch around the part. Oh, turn on my caps locks. There we go. And uh, we're going to have on the top of the part, we'll put uh, 100 thousandths on top. And then underneath of the part, we'll put quarter inch to represent the relative size of our stock. So our depth I'll probably make it a little bit longer, but that's the relative size. So we're able to set up our stock really quickly, get the orientation. If I wanted to put, let's say uh, I have the part in the machine like this, and I wanted to put the origin up the corner up here, I would just simply change this over to stock box point, and we can put the origin right up there. And that's our G54 right on the corner of the part. So real quick and easy, able to set up the stock. Now, I think what Matt would have done is used an adaptive clearing, a 3D adaptive to clear out as much of that as possible. So I think what they did was is added an adaptive clearing. I'm going to choose out of the library, and I know there was a project library that we were sharing, and I'm able to see that library if I can turn it on up here, um, was the bottle opener library. And I can filter down. I can turn off my samples, and I can work with some of the libraries working on the VF2, so I can leave that library open. So I can filter some of the tools from the libraries and shrink it down. So if I'm looking at, uh, say, the 3D profile we're working on, uh, some of the tools we have, uh, I'm not filtering on dimensions. Did I turn off a filter? Hang on a second. I think I might have turned off my filters here. Pretty sure I saved the bottle opener library. There it is. You go back into my library. I'm too quick with the clicking. So, and I think he started with a, a half inch. Uh, so I'm going to start with a half inch uh, flat mill that he was using. So let me go into this library. I'm going to choose that half inch flat rougher finisher. Brings it into the graphics view. Okay. I'm going to leave the geometry the way it is. It's going to look at the entire model according to the stock. And I think our passes were set up and we're leaving, yep, we're leaving 10,000 of stock on there. So I'm going to say okay. And notice it recognizes those that body that was uh, created that by Garin. It recognizes those boundaries and keeps that tool engaged as much as possible. Okay, so I can see that Matt's using that tapered entry for the for the helix. Uh, we've talked about that on some past webinars, but uh, if there's users that they're not using it, it's a great thing to help get chips out of deep holes. The taper going in is the helix going in is tapered, so it creates a cone shape. And it allows room for the chips to get out so you're not recutting them and then work hardening by the time you get into the pocket. So we can take a look at that while I have it highlighted. I'm going to go up here and simulate. You can start the simulation. I can also turn on, let me bring this over real quick. It's hidden behind my window here, guys. There we go. I can also turn on a representation of the stock. So we can see what it's going to look like as it's cutting through the stock there. And we can also grab a hold of this and speed it up a little bit. You can also hide those toolpaths by turning it to tail so we can see where the toolpath has been. And it's starting to rough out that basic shape of the bottle opener there. All right, so we have a roughed out basic shape. We're leaving some stock on the bottom. We can flip this over and face it off. So I might want that to go down a little bit below uh, the top of the part there after we flip it over. So I can always go back and easily change that, change the heights in here. I could say I want to go past or a little bit below the model bottom, let's say 50 thousandths below, and it drops. 
that's interesting. It drops it drops that down uh, about uh, I want to go fifty thousand. It's not five thousand, five hundred thousand. So it goes fifty thousands below. So it updates the toolpath. Now we're going a little bit below the parts. So when we face it off, we have a nice shape left there. And I think the next thing he did was use a quarter inch tool to try to get into this area here. Now with the three D toolpath, we want to contain the toolpath in the area that we want to keep the tool. So I'm going to select the tool first. I'm going to grab that quarter inch flat mill. I think we use the bull nose on this one, actually. So I'm going to filter down on bull nose tools. Okay, and down here, I think I have in the bottle opener library that quarter inch bull nose tool that Matt was using. And I want to keep that tool in this area here to try to clean up inside that pocket there, or at least remove some of those chips with a smaller tool. So I'm going to select in my geometry that area as a boundary. So I'm going to choose selection. I'm going to select this area. I'm going to grab that bottom of the pocket right there just to keep the tool engaged. It's going to recognize the geometry. It's going to respect that geometry. Okay. I can also tell it areas to avoid. Uh, and then also my passes, I want to make sure if I'm leaving any stock, uh, I'm going to make this uh, a little bit less. Say 5 thou. And another thing, too, is I want to make sure that in my rest machining, it's looking at the previous operation so it knows what was left, so I'm not trying to hog out all that stock that it believes is there. I'm going to say OK. And we get the adaptive clearing respecting the model and cleaning out that pocket with a smaller tool. And I think we want to do the same thing in the back here. So I'm going to copy that same adaptive down. I'm going to go down to Copy. Well, my setup, I'm going to paste that same adaptive. So I made a duplicate of the same adaptive clearing toolpath. But this time, I'm going to change the geometry. Instead of doing that pocket, I'm going to exit that out. I'm going to choose this pocket, this area here. I can also make it go down a little bit below. By using the heights, I can say model bottom. And again, I'll drop that down 20 thousandths below the model. You can also go 50 so that we're all the way through. I'm going to leave, yeah, let's go 50. Okay, and if I look at my rest machining, it's also looking at the previous operation, so it knows that we're able to cut where it left stock from that other operation. And now we have the same adaptive clearing, getting into that pocket, pocket back there. It's taking a little bit of a while there. Uh, you know what I didn't do? No, I think we're okay. It's stepping down into that pocket there. Wow, stepping really far down. Let me see what I did on my depth there. <laughs> 50 inches. There we go. So I'm too fast to type and I miss hitting the decimal point, which is important, which is why we do it, why it's great that it shows us this. And we can also go back and simulate just to make sure the tool's going to go where we want it. It's easy. You know, that, that highlights, this highlights a great point, though, because a lot of people that start using our product, they... They, they wonder why things like the heights plane default to from model stock and from model bottom, and they want to type in hard values. The truth is most mistakes are going to happen from human error typing in the wrong hard value, and this highlights that fact. Absolutely. And I'm one that has to always go back and check and make sure, because I'm very fast with typing, and I've got to learn to slow down and check and make sure I'm doing the right thing. Again, that's really where the simulation comes in to help where if I simulate and I see that tool going in the middle of nowhere, I go back and double check and say, yeah, I, I changed the, uh, the decimal place, or I forgot it somewhere. Uh, if I go to Adaptive 3, I'm going to drop down to this Adaptive here, and I'm going to hit Play, which shows me I'm able to do that right in the browser and jump to the one toolpath that I want to see here. And now I can see, I just saw it turn red right there. So if I go and take a look right here, it tells me rapid collision right there. So I want to go back and take a look and see what I'm doing with my collision there. And I'm going to check and make sure I'm, I'm pulling out of the stock before it drops down to the next place. But I want to show you, it's a good thing to see that it highlights on the simulation places where you got to go back and double check your toolpath. Okay. So I'll go back and fix that, but I'm realizing that we're getting pretty close to time. So I'm going to go through and show you these 3D toolpaths to remove uh, those chips. So one thing that Garen had mentioned where a lot of times we'll, we'll try to do as much as we can as uh, parametric modeling and using lofts and sweeps and things because uh, try, to, try to avoid some of that 3D uh, modeling, but we really shouldn't. We shouldn't be afraid of it, especially with these toolpaths. So we're able to get shapes like this. We can use toolpaths like, let's say, our 3D uh, parallel 
uh, 3D scallop to really clean up some of those faces with a ball end mill. Um, what I want to do first is I want to be able to have that region. Because remember, we talked about with the 3D toolpath, it's all about trying to contain the toolpath. I'm going to try to set up a quick sketch to contain the toolpath in this area. We may already have a sketch in here. We'll take a look. Um, no, that's okay. I'm going to make a quick sketch on that same plane just to show you how we could set up really quick a containment area to keep the tool in that area. So I'm going to create a new sketch on this face. I'm going to go back up into the model really fast. I'm going to go into the origin here, and I'm going to choose this face that I'm looking at straight down. That's my XY face. You don't have to do it this way. It's just one way that I like to do it. Uh, and I'm going to create a sketch in here. I'm going to do a rectangle. I'm going to hit R for rectangle. I'm going to start a rectangle from this area down to about this area right in here. Because I want to do is I want to capture this area, keep my tool in that area, contained in that area where that 3D geometry is. Now, sometimes you don't have to create sketches. Sometimes you can use geometry that's off your model. But in this case, I just want to show you I can create a quick sketch, and that will become the boundary where I want to keep the tool. Okay, I'm going to stop that sketch, go right back into my model, um, my cam. And now I want to add another toolpath. Let me regen these real quick. Go up to generation. I can hit control G or regenerate those toolpaths. Because I made a change to the part and I made the change to the model, it's going to recognize and it's going to re or, or have me regen those toolpaths. So I'm going to go in here. We're going to do a parallel. We'll do a 3D parallel toolpath. And for my tool, I'm going to use that ball nose end mill, the quarter inch ball that Matt was using. Now, for my containment, I want to contain it inside of this boundary of this sketch. I can also pull up that sketch right here and then choose that sketch I created as well. But I had left it on so you could see it when I, when I grabbed that sketch. Okay, so that's the boundary area where I want to keep the tool. Okay, I can choose some additional offset if I want to make sure the tool goes all the way around. Um, one thing I do want to have is I want to make sure that any of these places in here where it intersects that model, I can also choose those areas as surfaces, or I can choose avoidance area. So I want to avoid hitting this area with the tool, right? this area, because my, my boundary goes across those areas. And I also want to avoid hitting this and this. So now I can keep my tool engaged. I don't need to cut the sides. Now I want to concentrate just on those areas on the top of the part. Let me grab this one too. So now I can concentrate the tool path, the parallel, to stay right in that area on those surfaces of the part. Wayne, so, Wayne quick, uh, quick comment. You, I'm pretty sure you have your 3D connection mouse there. Um, maybe don't use it quite as much. The model's moving around a lot for people watching. Ah, gotcha. Sorry, it's habit. <laughs> it's a habit I have. Uh, so, uh, thanks, Al. So, for my heights, I'm going to leave them uh, as the model bottom. And for my passes, I want to make sure that I have the right direction going back and forth. We'll stay, keep it at 90 degrees. Uh, we'll go 100 thousandths for my step over. Probably want to go a little bit more tight. Um, yeah. Now, I actually use the decimal point. So, we'll go 10 thousandths step over so you can see the tool path. Uh, you can get much, much more fine than that. Okay, so I'm going to leave it like this, OK, and see what kind of toolpath we get on those surfaces. So now I'm going back and forth. I'll try not to move around too much, but now we're going back and forth into the model. And I'd like to try to stay along those surfaces so that my tool comes down and runs along those faces. So I'm going to edit that parallel. I'm going to change the direction of the parallel to be 0 degrees, so I'm running along that same axis. OK, so quickly I'm able to go back because it's always the same workflow for all the toolpaths. It's easy for me to find where those switches are and where I can add those parameters and change them in the toolpath to be able to get what I'm looking for. So I think that'll work out nicely. We could take a quick look in simulation. Again, I can highlight setup two to see all the toolpaths, go and simulate them. I can also, again, jump down to that parallel so I can watch and see what that parallel is going to do. I think this is the way that Matt and the team were working on the VF2 to have that tool going back and forth to make sure that we're able to clean up that area really everybody nicely. Catch, everybody catch Wayne's little trick? It's a nice one. I think a lot of people don't realize that they can do that, how he, how he clicked uh, the parallel toolpath uh, from the browser. There's a lot of ways that you can do that. 
um, you can filter down on what you've already seen, where you can use this fast forward or go to next operation. You can do that back and forth. You can also right click in the uh, in the the uh, canvas view, and you can say previous event, next event, and you can also add bookmarks, and you can also change uh, between events by using your right mouse click button. So there's a lot of different ways that you can get to in and out of using simulation to be able to get to the toolpath you're looking for. Um, I'm just realizing we got through a couple of the toolpaths. It's now at the top of the hour. Um, I can keep going if you guys would like to see a little bit more on the way that Matt set up the toolpaths. Um, I don't know if you guys might want to ask some questions. If you guys, uh, Al and the team, if you see any well, questions coming. Probably, uh, some people are saying keep going, and, and there's also some questions here. So uh, let's let's address a couple questions and then if we still have some time after that we can uh, we can jump back in to, to keep going sure um, there, there's a couple good ones here uh, one is actually suggestion that maybe in the future we do a webinar on uh, large format machining there's a there's a guy here uh, Craig who's got uh, a very large, uh, large router doing large molds. I assume maybe large aluminum molds and a large Haas router. So, uh, some tips and tricks for how you manage uh, very large data sets. Uh, sounds like a great webinar, and may maybe uh, that's something that can come in on the questions. Is there other topics that you'd like to see us or address? The next question circles around uh, rest machining, um, and and actually does play a role in uh, in the previous question of uh, large working with large data sets. Rust machining does uh, add a heavy load to toolpath calculation. It turns a lot of things into linear processes instead of parallel. So it means when you regenerate a, whole, a large model, you can't start generating a bunch of toolpaths that needs to solve them sequentially. So there's there's absolutely um, calculation drawbacks to using rust machining. Uh, it certainly is useful for far more than just um, than just adaptive clearing or roughing. For example, a lot of a lot of CAM systems have a, a, just a REST toolpath, which uh, in a lot of cases is, is simply what our pencil toolpath is with multiple step overs. So, so the pencil toolpath is an example of a finishing strategy that is very commonly used with REST machining to kind of get the scallops out of internal corners. Um, but many places where you would use it. Uh, not one more question here. Uh, uh, there's Roger here. Sort of, uh, you, you asked some great questions around the use of the timeline. Um, Gary, and I loved how you showed it at the beginning. There's two modes you can use Fusion in. One uh, captures design history. When you're capturing design history, you get access to that timeline. Um, yes, it's it's fun and it's an educational tool to see how you model, but more importantly, as you're designing your model, you saw Garen uh, use the slot tool to create the, the rough shape of it. Um, most of us don't know the finished design when we start. It's sort of an iterative process where you work on this and then you go back and refine the detail there and, and you're slowly iterating closer and closer on your finished design. So the timeline allows you to go back and, and make a change to what you did uh, four, five, ten steps ago and have it uh, propagate through and still capture all of the, the things that you did in the future. So it's, it's really a way of allowing you to iterate and work back and forth through your process without, uh, without having a waterfall where you have to start over if you take four steps back. Yeah, and Al, to, to add to that a tiny bit, you know, it's nice to roll back and make a change, but also you can roll back and add new features. So, you know, imagine if you had a box and then you shelled it out and realized that you wanted to fill it the four corners before you shell it. You Instead of having to delete the shell, put fillets, and then reshell it, you basically just roll back before the shell, add your fillets, roll forward, and everything is, is as, as you would want. So you can actually tweak that history over time and, and even drag and drop things around to, to change history. So it's pretty powerful. Is there a downside to um, uh, not capturing design history? Garen, you, you know this a little bit more than me. I know there's some direct editing capabilities that are only in a non-history a non, uh, mode. Is there anything beyond the direct editing capabilities, Garen? 
Um, well, you know, we've there was a there was a move face command that was really only accessible in direct modeling, which has now been uh, moved to to parametric. You know, there um, there are times when if if uh, if you're just modeling something and it's maybe a standard part that you don't really have any intent in manufacturing or you don't need to make changes to it, sometimes it's easier to do it indirect and you have a little more flexibility. Uh, but you, at any time, so you can take a parametric model and convert it as, uh, as Wayne is showing you. You can convert it to, you can remove all the history from it. So, you know, sometimes I will do that and then I don't have to worry about, you know, changing a hole and it updates something else, you know, it just strips all that out. But, you know, the upside of it is, you know, let, let's say I, I have a plate, I put a hole through it, and then I grab um, a face on the plate and pull it back where that hole would be gone. In the direct world, that hole will never come back. In a parametric world, that hole is still there if you just move the face back in its original location. I, I don't, you know, without visuals, that may be a little hard to understand. But, you know, once you delete something in direct, it's gone. In a parametric history environment, that's still, there's still history behind it. It's still there. You can bring it back. Um, so, you know, there is some safety nets in working in a parametric environment as well. So they, they both have advantages and, and disadvantages, but 90% of, of the time... In a lot of ways, the mental model thing, sort of knowing that you have the power of parametrics and leveraging it is a way to think while you're designing, and I personally sort of think that way, but there's definitely times where you just want to feel like it's a a block of clay, if you will, and you can you can stick some on and pull some off, and you're not really worrying, like Garen said, about is there downstream effects of this change? It's just they're just changes, and that's all it is. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we we dragged it we dragged this one a little long. We had some great questions though. Um, I'm glad you guys walked through that. Uh, before everybody leaves, I'm curious, uh, again, did you like us covering a little bit of design in this one? Do you want to see more of that? Is there suggestions beyond this large format machining uh, question? I, I really like that. It's actually a strength of us is tool path calculation time, and we haven't really done a good job highlighting it, so we should. But uh, in the questions there, you can throw some comments uh, before we wrap things up. And, and otherwise, thank you for staying later. It's, it seems like they did definitely like it. it. It seemed like there was some good feedback the last time. I think you did maybe the last one, Wayne. I remember when you did some four-axis programming. Um, and it looks like people are appreciating us showing the design to manufacturing workflow, not just starting as if the design was done. So thanks for joining us, Garen. It sounds like we'll have you back presenting a couple more times. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep, thanks for joining us, Brandon and uh, and Garen. We really appreciate it, and it was good to walk through. and, and we, we like to show off the collaboration and and talk about like a, the good results of the fast tracks we have, getting to know people, getting to meet people in our community, uh, and uh, hearing stories, uh, especially background information from uh, the history and and talking with Brandon and uh, to get to know uh, some of those great collaboration and stories that we have out there. So, uh, thanks, guys. Sure. Sorry about the yeah, uh, master cam comment. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. It was, it was a good thing for us. I just want to make sure that everybody knows that uh, as a company and as a person, I've got a lot of respect for, for where they've, they've taken us. It's not like it's a terrible product. So. Oh, yeah. I, and, and, and I believe that, uh, trust me, not coming from a uh, machinist stand, uh, standpoint, but, I mean, I've been tattooing for a long time. Tattooing is changing just like machining is. I get it, and I, and I don't want to promote promote that because um, I would never in my first industry of tattooing would want I'd never want to promote that we we don't uh, look at the the ones that came before us and with disrespect you know I just get excited that's all no it, it's good and I loved having you here and, and it really does show this story that um, machining is more accessible uh, it's a way to extend your art in your case uh, creating tools that are actually used to create your art but uh, it's exciting to have people like you talk about how approachable machining is now. Yeah, I like it. And, uh, and I, I always feel very um, honored to be involved. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon. And uh, you know, if there's nothing else, you know, everyone have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for joining me Friday's Fast Track Hangout. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, guys.